All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to another USAP uh, webinar. I am Adrian Austin, Product Marketing Manager here at USA Technologies, and today we'll be focusing on ways to optimize your route scheduling. Uh, thank you all for, for joining today. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to provide some, some basic guidance and some administrative guidance here for the webinar today. Uh, you'll notice on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a go to meeting questions box. Here you can list any questions that you have uh, for our speakers today during the presentation. Uh, feel free to submit questions at any time while they're speaking. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session where we'll try to answer as many of them as we have time to. So feel free to post any time. And even the questions that we don't get time to, to answer on the live broadcast, we'll be reaching out to you guys over email to, to help get you some answers. All right, so today's webinar is being presented by Terry Hovis, our Director of Implementation here at USA Technologies, and Jared Detweiler, Vice President of Operations at OneSource Office Refreshment. So a little bit of background about our presenters. Terry is a NAMA certified executive, 30-year veteran of the vending industry, and experienced feed cloud expert. Terry has mastered every level of the vending business from route driver to all the way up to senior manager. Now, before joining Cantaloupe Systems, Terry managed a 250-person operation at the Tampa at Tampa Bay Vending. He's also been a route supervisor, an area manager, a public relations and customer attendance manager, and a district manager overseeing vending operations in three major metropolitan metropolitan areas. So, welcome, Terry. Thanks, Adrian. Um, I, we're not seeing your screen. Oh, you're not seeing my screen. That is not good. Thanks for the heads up. Are everyone all set? Welcome, everybody. <laughs> all right, and moving on to Jared Detweiler. Uh, Jared is the Vice President of Operations at One Source Office Refreshment Service, located in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, where he is a 14-year veteran. After graduating from Shippensburg University with a BSBA and a major in marketing, Jared joined One Source as his route supervisor. After three years, he moved on to an operations manager role, and in early 2013 became, began a company-wide technology rollout. Jared's current role includes integrating all lines of business under the seed platform, including vending, OCS, and micromarkets, increased route efficiency, and geographically segmented routes. Jared, thanks for being here. Absolutely, I appreciate you guys having me. All right, this should be a little easier now that you guys can see my, see my screen to follow along. So in this webinar today, we'll be starting by going over a quick uh, overview of some new things that have been happening here at USA Technology. Then Terry will jump into some of the, challenge, the challenges uh, associated with route scheduling that we're seeing many operators facing today. From there, we'll dive into how to track and measure different aspects of scheduling in your operation, and also go through three different types of scheduling method, methods that can be used depending on the situation of your machine. After that, I'll, we'll turn things over to Jared, where he will talk, walk us through how he runs operations at one source and provide some of his suggestions on how operators can improve their scheduling efficiency. Lastly, we'll end it with Terry and Jared opening it up for some Q&A. So what's new here at USAT? As you may have heard, USA Technologies recently acquired Cantaloupe Systems earlier this year. Uh, I myself came from the Cantaloupe side of the marketing, so we're very excited for this uh, acquisition. Both companies have now joined forces to provide the industry's best solution for cashless payments, vending management software, and more. So we're very excited for this merger and really being the first enterprise-wide platform for unattended retail. And we get asked a lot, you know, what does that mean for, for current eport and seed users today? Well, it's a few things. Uh, now it means that your machines equipped with ePort devices can now enjoy the same reporting capabilities as you have in C. It means you can use a single interfacing system for all of your C cashless and ePort equipped machines. And really in short, it means you can keep doing what you're doing today, uh, but a lot easier and with more capabilities. It also means that it also means that different users can also take advantages of the new ePort hardware offerings without having to worry about running those different reports or managing different systems. So everything from the G10S with, you know, campus card functionality and Apple VAS capabilities to interact, the interactive with on-screen nutritional info and advertising. So really exciting time 
for both, uh, both users of each company. Anyway, that's my spiel. Uh, that's enough from me. So let me hand it over to Terry, who will begin to talk us through some of the challenges of route scheduling that we're seeing today. Thanks, Adrian. Hi, everybody. All right, first of all, machine scheduling certainly is a balancing act. The idea that uh, our customers don't want to see empty columns, obviously, and you cannot sell what's not stocked. In addition, operators like yourselves don't want to service or want to service machines as little as possible. So we almost have a customer versus op operator scenario. Throw into that mix that each driver has a fixed number of hours that they can actually work per day, and you see the challenges behind actually uh, optimizing your scheduling. In a perfect world, we can maximize the number of machines per route while eliminating out of stocks. Seems like quite a challenge, right? So the impact of scheduling on service and efficiency begins with service level. So, you know, it, it's a funny thing, you know, when I see people manually scheduling, they really have two choices. They can either under service machines or they can over service machines. In most cases, you're gonna choose to over service machines for obvious reasons. If we under service machines, we're going to certainly control our route costs, um, but the problem is we're gonna have more out of stocks, which leads to customer dissatisfaction. We're certainly gonna decrease our sales in that process. When we over service, we, we control those out of stocks, but now we're getting less fills per machine and we require more, more driver hours, which ultimately leads, ultimately leads to more drivers. So that leads us to driver efficiency. Driver efficiency is you know, the idea that I'm going to service this many machines per day. As a route driver, I can only service this many. Um, we picked a pretty average number of 32 here in this, this illustration. And the idea behind it is most of the people we meet are come somewhere between, you know, 60 and 70 fills per visit. So we're looking at 65 visits or 65 fills per visit. Total routes, that would lead to 160 machine, 160 machines per day for your entire company if you have five routes. By simply increasing our fills to 100 per machine, we can get down somewhere be below 20, somewhere 19, 20 range machines. You multiply that by five, the number of routes that you have, and now you're looking at less than 100 machines a day. It becomes really clear how you can eliminate 34, 30 to 40% of your routes. In this case, I could easily reduce my company down to three routes. Get a little feedback there. <laughs> so in doing so, a lot of times, you know, we can obviously reduce these routes and we can be really aggressive. You know, maybe our market is tied into a smaller area and five routes is probably the best or, or the number of customers we have are probably the, the max we're going to get. But there's a lot of cases where people want to grow their business. Jared, can you speak on, on some things like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we initially started with our seed rollout in 2013, um, the goal was to become more efficient across the board. And uh, But we had a very strong growth pattern. Uh, we had acquisitions in line that we were looking to, uh, to take on, as well as a lot of organic growth from the sales team that we had assembled. Um, so our goal with implementing seed was to build these routes to, to get better, perform better, you know, weekly sales numbers and be able to add more locations and machines per route. Um, so in our, our system, we didn't actually consolidate routes. We just made our routes way more efficient and were able to drive higher, higher volumes out of those routes. Thanks, Jared. So as you see, there's, you know, there's options there, but the idea is that we definitely want to get more fills per machine so that we can service more machines per route. So that leads to some of the key metrics. What we know is that the analysis of operator data shows 35 to 40% of machines could have been skipped per day. And I can tell you from you know almost 11 years of experience that that's a conservative figure. A lot of times I see much over 50%. The challenge is to make these changes needed to lower that percentage. And if you're doing this manually, this is really complicated, very difficult. 
Um, I've seen people do it, they put a lot of hours into it, and they still don't get those results. Uh, the net effect is you get higher fills per visit and potential route reduction because less machines need service on a given day. So what are the key metrics that we use to manage this balancing act? Starts with the number of sellouts per machine. Obviously, we don't like sellouts. The customers don't like sellouts. So when we look at a beverage machine, really should be one or less. And I say less, you know, there should be some sort of play in there. We call it a depletion level. Ideally, the driver's walking in the door to fill this machine at the same time somebody's buying that second or third to the last soda. A snack machine, on the other hand, should be probably like three UPCs because we're talking about a five wide machine that has 45 selections in it. <laughs> Keep it in mind, of course, that that snack machine um, has a defined sold out, meaning that it's not completely sold out. We don't include a glass front beverage in there, mainly because these become kind of confusing, but simply put, if you fill your glass front like it's a closed front, where you have less than nine or 10 selections, then you would service it just the same way. On a glass front that you fill that's more like a snack machine, you have 45 different items in them, it sounds crazy, but it happens, then you would service it like a snack machine. Something in between, you would obviously set that up somewhere in between. So the other thing we look at is the number of fills per machine. And obviously these differ by machine types. So we kind of look at more of a percentage. If your software currently has that option, you can look at when you first go to dynamic scheduling, you'll look at something like probably 30 to 35% of the machine is sold. Um, after merchandising, which we'll touch on later in this presentation, you want to get that up to you know 40, 45%. The big thing, really important, is to focus on your units filled and not the dollars. For the for one reason, we're man, you know by managing the units, the dollars to follow. But most importantly, because of the changes of fluctuations and price points, it's not you know following by dollars is not a real accurate way to identify how well a machine's doing. A good example, if if I can take a minute to explain, is I remember early in in my days with Cantaloupe meeting an operator that had a route that was doing 15,000 a week. And he was really proud of this route. But when we started looking into this route, the fills were pretty much equal to a guy that was doing 10,000. As we dug deeper, we realized that the reason for this was this guy had a lot of convention centers and they were vending soda for $6 a bottle. So as you see, there could be a big fluctuation in because the price points are very different. So we have three ways to schedule and seed. This is really important. Most people are used to a static schedule. This is really common. It's the most common scheduling type in the industry. Um, 10 years ago, this was probably predominant. 95% of people in the business schedule this way. This is typically determined at the time the account is sold, and it's usually based on a head count at the location. And that probably everybody on this call can relate. We just sold this piece of business, it has 130 people in it. That means it's twice a day. So let's look at Johnny's route and see if it's gonna fit Monday and Thursday, or if we have to do Tuesday, Friday, because those are the two day a week trends. But it tends to be a lot less efficient as it focuses more on what the driver can handle instead of what the machine needs. And I've seen people that constantly adjust their static schedule based on historical sales, and they do a pretty good job, but there's still times when the sales are either greater or less than normal, which makes those changes very ineffective. The ideal scheduling type is dynamic scheduling. The reason why it's ideal is because it looks at the condition of the machine. It looks at the machine, it decides if it requires service, and it'll even pull in machines that don't need service, but won't make it to the next service day. There's three potential triggers, and you determine what the cr criteria is for that service. The best part about dynamic scheduling is you can actually adjust it to meet customer demands. 
So if you've ever worked with somebody like myself, we have what we call standard settings. But along the way, you're always gonna find that customer that's a little bit different and they'll have to address those needs. And this is how you would do it. And the last type of scheduling is what we call interval scheduling. Now, this is similar to static scheduling, but I kind of look at it as a hybrid between dynamic scheduling and static scheduling because it'll, what it allows you to do is avoid those machines that don't necessarily drive revenue. And it's great for the machines that you might want to service once a week or twice a week, but you don't want to go there just to service them. A great example is a coffee machine. And in this example, what, what you see here is that we can actually set this to see this machine once a week, every seven days, but we can allow plus or minus three days for flexibility. That way, when a dynamic machine gets called in, it'll bring this machine in with it. So this is your second level of efficiency. And that leads to merchandising. Scheduling in itself, dynamic scheduling, will bring your company tremendous efficiency. But merchandising will take you to the whole next level. And why is this important? Well, st static product mix means less money in your pocket. So, you know, the idea is set it and forget it. It doesn't allow for you to remove slow items, which is eventually going to increase your spoilage. It doesn't allow you to recognize fast moving products and make sure that you account for that by adding more coils for that product. It, it basically makes you stagnant. And then you have the other side, drivers, they're not gonna make merchandising decisions to maximize profit. Truth be told, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, I think a lot of route drivers really focus on merchandising. I don't see that so much today. So I think these decisions really need to move into the office. Um, if you're asking your drivers to make these decisions for you, I think even the best drivers will tend to merchandise 80% of the machine instead of the whole 100%. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that you really need the ability to mine this data. It's really difficult to make these decisions if you don't have a clear view of what is actually selling in your machine. You know, I, I look back in my days when I was uh, running a vending operation, and what I really remember the most is that I always knew what left the building quickly. <laughs> I never really knew what sold in the machines very well. And that's an important piece because are these items being thrown away? Are they riding in the truck? Are they just sitting in a machine? It's difficult to know. So here are some basic merchandising tips. Better merchandising will help extend service frequencies and increase sales. And to expand on that, I will go as far as to say that better merchandising will pretty much handle every business goal you have. By merchandising your machines, you can increase revenue by providing high demand items. You'll decrease spoilage by removing the slowest selling items. You'll decrease cost of service because you're gonna go to the machine a whole lot less. And the other thing to think about is when you're decreasing your service, that affects other parts of your business. It could affect your money room, it can affect your warehouse. So all these things factor in, certainly the gas pump. And most importantly, I think this increases customer satisfaction and these all lead to high profits. Um, another point is that top sellers need to be in the highest capacity columns in a beverage machine. I know this sounds like common sense, but I know in my days, it, we'd set up a machine that pretty much stayed that way. So if we had Mountain Dew in a single coil and it became the fastest selling item in that machine, we'd never take the time to go out and replace Pepsi with Mountain Dew and make sure that it, it had the real estate that it deserved. Also, top sellers should be looked at to double up in beverage and snack machines. I know, you know, an old way of thinking was you never doubled up anything that you wanted variety. But the truth is, is that customers appreciate you having the products and the machines that they're looking for. And it certainly goes a long way to reducing your service frequency. Now this one, 
top sellers must be in every machine. I certainly agree they should start off in every machine. But when I look back again, maybe nine years ago, um, when we were pretty early in our days of uh, dynamic scheduling and really taking off, there was an opportunity with a group of vending operators. I think there were 14 companies. And I remember a stat that they provided that stated that Cheez-Its were the most popular item sold. They, they had the highest sales volume. But of those product of Cheez-Its, 20% of the machines that, that Cheez-Its was placed in didn't sell at all. So really, merchandising needs to be at a machine by machine basis. And of course, shorter shelf life items might not need to be in many machines. You really have to manage those short shelf life items. Uh, very, very important. Okay, I'm gonna turn this over to Jared at OneSource. I think he's the star of the show. Um, he's gonna show you what kind of results you can expect um, and maybe give you some points of his own. Jared? Thanks, Jerry, I appreciate it. All right, so one source office refreshment where I work. Um, it was founded in 1980 by uh, Robert and Jackie Betts. Uh, we're headquartered in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. We're about 35 miles outside of Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, from our branch, uh, we're a single branch operator. Uh, we service about 60 air miles from this location in any given direction. Uh, as far as number of routes that we have, we've got 20 vending and micro market routes out there. Um, our, our drivers service both vending machines and micro markets all from the same truck. And then we have two dedicated office coffee routes to go with the office coffee delivery on the standard vending and market routes. Uh, we've got approximately 2,500 vending machines out on the street, and uh, we've got 63 micro markets placed right now uh, with another five in the pipeline in the next month or two. So some results and recommendations uh, are from me on scheduling, merchandising, and just, just seed in general. Uh, with the help of seed scheduling tools, we've been able to increase our average route totals by over 49%. And this is pretty evident in the numbers that I'm about to show you here. Uh, before we used dynamic scheduling, our average route total was just over $10,000. And we thought that we were running very strong routes at that time. And at that time, we were. There wasn't a lot of adoption into telemetry and into seed and dynamic scheduling. Um, now, after dynamic scheduling, we run our numbers and we're seeing consistent averages of over $15,000 across our routes. We've got some higher, we've got some lower based on, you know, geography and uh, the amount of time that they have windshield time and things of that nature. But $15,000 routes are extremely achievable. And especially when you incorporate uh, micro markets onto your vending routes, it makes it even easier because you're able to segment these routes much, much better and schedule them properly. Um, our average asset service per day also made a difference. Um, prior to dynamic scheduling, we were servicing about 26 per route, or 26 per day per route. Um, after dynamic scheduling, even with increasing the fills per machine, because our drivers were not taking that additional trip in and out, not having to worry about load their trucks and things of that nature, we were still able to take that number up to 31 assets, average asset service per day. I do have a few routes that I'm servicing as many as 50 to 60 assets per day, uh, just based on the how tight they are geographically and how, how good our route driver really is. But the real reason I'm here is some of my results and recommendations of, you know, ways that you can really manage your business better, schedule your routes better, and, and make sure you're driving that profit margin home to your business. Um, one thing that I do, and it's something I've done ever since I gave scheduling up initially to a full-time scheduler, was I continue to schedule routes myself. Uh, this is for many different reasons. There may be times where I'm just doing one route a couple days a week. There may be times where I'm doing three routes for, for an entire week. Uh, what it allows me to do is to see exactly, A, what my scheduler is doing. So I'm able to supervise and make sure that she is scheduling all of the machines that are out there properly. We're hitting all of our accounts on time. We're not showing too many empties, but we're also not over-servicing. Because as most of you know, labor is the problem with this industry, and to reduce that labor really drives home your profit margins. Um, I also like to schedule because I like to see the merchandising changes, and I like to see how product mixes are changing. Um, you know, what is starting to sell? Are healthier products doing better for us? Which we've seen a trend going upward finally. You know, after a lot of introduction of new products. 
Um, and I also like to make sure that our scheduling settings are correct. Terry went over uh, the three different ways to schedule, and the majority of our machines are dynamically scheduled. Those scheduling settings are probably the most important part of knowing what your drivers and your scheduler are doing. These scheduling settings, based on the, uh, the amount of depletions you're okay with, allow your scheduler to perform at her finest, his or her finest. Um, we have some, some routes and some customers that we know that they're okay with having a few empties in their machine, and if that's the case, let's extend our service time, let's extend our average fills and our average collection, and let's bring home more money per visit. I also think that a very important part is if you're able to have a full-time scheduler and you're someone who really dives deep into your routes, they should have the merchandising authority to make any type of changes that they see fit. Um, while rebates are extremely important, the rebates will come with the proper merchandising in these machines. Um, I allow my scheduler to change par levels, to change products, to even put in service tickets for changing prices and reconfiguring machines. Uh, like Terry said, a, a closed front beverage machine that you don't have the top seller in that double capacity column, you're wasting time just going back to visit it. Um, you know, that, that 48 capacity as opposed to 24 or 28 makes a big, big difference because a lot of times you're only going for, for that one product that's setting off the depletion level. So the, the, more, the more your scheduler is allowed to do, the better your business is going to work. Hey, Jared. Yes. Would, would you say that the workflow of the scheduler, when it, comes, it just makes sense to do merchandising because of all the information that's available? Yeah, absolutely. And this, this is something that I, I tried to teach my scheduler when I took over. Um, merchandising, while well, it's great to sit down with your reporting and say, you know, I'm spoiling products here, I need to make merchandising changes. When you're going through that actual schedule, you see that, hey, the reason I'm going to this machine today is because Coke is out. But I only had $50 in this machine and I don't have Coke at full capacity. It takes no time at all at that point to go in change your par level to full capacity. And next thing you know, instead of going every seven days, you may extend that to 11 or 12 days. And, and just something as simple as that, Terry, really makes the, the big difference. And especially in a small snack and soda account where you're just trying to drive your, your, your visit time as long as possible um, and your average collect number is really high. And I think that coincides with, you know, scheduling it does take time to do correctly. There's days when there's a lot of things going on and you need your scheduler to make sure, you know, they get through, you know, a route in two to three minutes. And that's no problem. It's very easily done. Uh, but 10 to 15 minutes a route is, is probably what you want to focus on most days. And this allows you to do those merchandising changes. Um, and it, it, like I said, with the reference to Coke in a, in a conventional machine up in the par level or just changing Doritos to add a second column of those because you've seen countless times that you're going back to that machine just because Doritos are empty. Well, let's double or triple up, and, and that will allow you, you know, to do that. And you have to look at 30 machines per route. So, you know, a quick glance at each one of them and make a couple changes. Next thing you know, you've got more efficient machines. Um, and also, I also would like to say keep a close eye on your parameters. Um, I did tell you that, you know, the depletion levels are important, and so, so are the, uh, the money level and the, the days to visit. Uh, there may be closed front machines where you have mostly water in those and, you know, most of our beverage machines are 28 or 30 days max visit. Well, we take those up to 90 days because there's no need to go visit those water. We know the water is not going to go expired. We're not going to have any spoilage. And those type of machines, you can generate a three to $400 collection depending on your pricing. And it's also a good reason to check your dollar volume too, because like Terry said, with the routes that are selling $6 bottles of soda, they may not need the same scheduling parameters that you have for most of your machines. You might need to extend that to a $500 maximum before it comes up for service because nothing's empty in the machine and you haven't been there in so long, but it's sold that much volume of product at $5 per event. Um, so it's important to keep a close eye on all your parameters across all your machine types. And then one thing that we've been recently able to do is, is dynamically schedule micro markets with or without fresh food, and we've even started to do it with fresh food. Um, all of our fresh food accounts are statically scheduled, um, at least for the food machine or the food cooler. Uh, but what we've been able to find out over time is that some of these snack racks or beverage coolers specifically don't need to be serviced every time that that food cooler serviced. And micro markets, while we do see an increase in sales, they're very labor intense, a service visit takes quite a long time. Um, and by having the dynamically scheduled 
assets within that micro market, you're really able to cut down that service time and, and make these micro markets as profitable as they possibly can. All right, awesome. Hey, Terry and Jared, thanks a lot for presenting today. Those are the, the slides we had to present. Uh, the next section we're going to be going on to is the Q&A section. So if you didn't have any questions that you wanted to ask, now's a great time to go into the question box to the right-hand side of the GoToWebinar control panel and drop down the questions menu and type it in there. Uh, while people are, are going and typing questions, we have a few that already came in. Uh, I believe this one could, this could be both for, for Jared or Terry. And it is on dynamic scheduling, do all three of the triggers need to be hit? I assume that needs to be hit to go and go out and trigger visiting a machine. Okay, this one's easy, so I'll take it, Jared. I'll let you get the more complex ones. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, any one of those three triggers will um, schedule the machine. So that's the minimum cash, and and I know the example I showed was kind of high. I think it was 225 or 250. Um, a snack machine, for example, would probably be more like 175. A uh, closed front drink machine would typically be somewhere, you know, 225 to 275, depending on the price point, and a glass front somewhere in between. But absolutely, those are three different triggers, and all three will trigger service. Got it. All right. Uh, next one we have coming up is what goals should be set for fill averages? So maybe, well, maybe yeah. Do you want to take that, Jared? Well, well I'll, I'll start with it, Terry, and, and give kind of one source point of view, and maybe you can give kind of a best practices point of view. Um, for us, I mean, we we maybe we may over service accounts a little bit, but as far as fill averages are concerned, we shoot for on, on a standard five wide snack um, and, and glass fronts. We want to hit over a hundred on an average per route, um, and that's the fill visit per average on the route. Um, we have some routes that are able to do over 100, and those are that we have a lot of closed front stack vendors where you can really push that average higher. Um, glass fronts are a little more challenging. Uh, we don't set a lot of our glass fronts up like stack vendors. We use a lot of variety, usually in the neighborhood of anywhere from 20 to 25 uh, SKUs. So with those, it's a little more difficult uh, to achieve that those kind of numbers. But on average, I think 100 fills per visit is, is where you want to be, if not higher. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, you know, what I'll say is that I see, you know, initially when people go to dynamic scheduling, they're going to fall somewhere between 95 and 100 on their fills. Um, it'll increase as they merchandise. So just simply by improving your scheduling technique, you're going to be able to get to close to 100 fill average. But merchandising will take you to greatness and when I say greatness if you get to 120 units per machine 125 you're gonna be great you're gonna see huge routes and huge profits awesome so another question coming in is is there a way to have the schedule show up on a driver's iPod or iPad uh, if you want it to be serviced without the su supervisor having to go in and move them around Um, I'm not sure what that actually means, but it sounds like the order, the order in Seed Mobile of how uh, the customers' and machines show up. Um, actually, a driver can move those around. They can, um, they're kind of drag and drop with your finger. Um, it's you know one of those techniques that you kind of have to master. I'm not great at it, but um, you can drag and drop. If that's wrong, please add to your question. Thanks. Yeah, the only other the only other way I could see that that possibly going is that if you're trying to add a machine after pre-pick uh, or something along those lines, and maybe you wanted to add a, a, another asset to it, and that you can do, and you can run another pre-pick for the account. The only the only challenge is the driver would need to sign out and then sign back in to see mobile, and it would be available for them to to see on their iPod or iPhone. Gotcha. All right, another question. Uh, with dynamic scheduling, how do you prevent a route driver from having a really high number of machines or really low number of machines from day to day? If they're scheduled 
<laughs> they hit your, and yeah. when they hit your parameters, how can you control what a driver can handle so, a particular volume for that day? So I always was I was always worried about this, and I'm going to take this time to tell a story that happened literally like 12 years ago, back when I was in vending. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is I was one of the part of one of the companies that tested Seed when it first came out, and every day that we were set to go, I kept running a schedule on it like 15, 16 machines would come up on a route that this guy was normally doing 40 machines a day. And I kept kind of aborting the whole project and saying, no, we're not doing that. Cause I was scared to death that 80 machines were gonna show up the next day. Well, I can tell you that in my close to 11 years doing this, I've never seen that happen. But I'll also tell you that there is kind of a pattern where Monday is typically gonna be the heaviest day and then it'll get a little bit easier on Tuesday, a little bit better on Wednesday and Thursday, and then kind of go back up a little bit on Friday. Um, so there's a pattern like that, but I think that's pretty much the same as, you know, static schedule. Jared, if you want to add to that, you can. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what you're saying, and it, and it is, it's where the human element of scheduling comes in. I mean, as, as important as of all your scheduling parameters are, I mean, in the in the real life aspect of this, you will face challenges where there there may be a few machines that you're going to need to push off to the next day, um, and that's where the the scheduler is a really important part. And uh, the the better that they're familiar with the routes, the better that your machines are merchandised. You know, if they need to take a slower location and push it till Tuesday or push it till Wednesday, these are things that can happen, and that way you can you can fulfill a full day for all of your route drivers throughout the week. And uh, you know, proper scheduling techniques will allow that to happen. And and like you said, Terry, that, that to, to push Friday, push some stops up on Friday so Monday doesn't become as heavy. These are things that you learn as you as you move through the scheduling processes. Great. All right, another question coming in. Do you have pointers for scheduling bill changers? Yes. So it depends on your money room, really. If your money room is flexible, and they will allow for you to um, give them a list, say two o'clock in the afternoon of bill changers that you need for the next day, um, then by all means, I would use the interval schedule similar to the coffee machines. Uh, that way you're not making a special trip. Um, other than that, the only other option is to do static scheduling. So in most places, and I would hope all places that have a change machine, they most likely have a food machine also. Um, so if you're going to do a changer that's static schedule, make sure that you include the food machine and make it static as well. Um, it, it would be a real disappointment if you went to a location simply to change out the change machine. Yeah, bill changers were something that uh, that we had to kind of change our processes in the money room a little bit just to make sure that it worked with us because before, just like all of our rest of our schedules, bill changers were static and the money room knew which, which bag needed to go out for the next day. And the majority of ours have been now interval scheduled. And one, one thing that we did is we cut down the amount that was in all of the bill changers to only three different amounts um, so that the, the money room could very easily prepare those for the next day. And about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we, we come down with the list for the bill changers and they get put out in the lockers uh, for the next day. We do have a few that are statically scheduled and those are in, in rare circumstances where the, the bill changer is really the, the machine that needs to be serviced. And these are in mostly like drug rehab facilities, but a lot of times we're pairing it with another one of the machines to make the trip worthwhile. Yeah, that's a great point. That's one thing that can really help your money room in a lot of ways is to reduce the number different, um, I guess, uh, levels of currency that you put in your change change machines. You know, um, limiting the the different options would certainly help as well. Got it. Another question: uh, Do you dynamically schedule for glass front cold food machines? Um, so if you're talking about glass front, like the type that like a 780 that looks like a snack machine, uh, we absolutely do. Uh, a lot of people have started doing that. If you look at talking about more of the carousel type, those are really difficult to do. If you've ever read a DEX file, the select, each, <laughs> each section presents as a coil, so it's really difficult. Um, even if you could, I think it, the 
the challenges that are, the driver would face would be very difficult. But sure, on a glass front food that is designed like a snack machine, um, you could absolutely not only schedule, but you can pre-kit it as well. And we are we are actually doing that. Uh, we've we've eliminated about 75% of our rotating machines for that exact reason, and uh, it allows us to better control the product that's going in. And uh, we're pre-kitting all of the frozen product that's coming out uh, of our warehouse, and then our drivers are ordering for certain coils in that machine the fresh product that's going in there, our fresh sandwiches and our hoagies, the things that get delivered into us. Um, and with almost all of our glass front food machines, we incorporate. Uh, usually at least one, possibly two shelves of beverages. And what this allows us to do is, is uh, get some more funds out of that machine rather than just food, because we all know how much spoilage and waste is involved with food, whether it be fresh or frozen food items. Uh, and this, uh, having the beverages in there also allows that money, that machine to make a little bit more money. Yeah, and one last point on that is when you're setting up your dynamic scheduling um, criteria, you, you want to look at your max days as the max days that the product will, you know, the smallest shelf life item will hold so that, you know, you don't have the spoilage issue. Yeah, that's a great point. All, all our max days are either five or seven days, depending on if we're using fresh product or if we're, if we're using all thawed product. So, yeah, that is something that we did have to do, too. Great. Another question, uh, what is the estimated time it would take for a beginner to schedule a route? So assume somebody that is just uh, getting used to, to seed. I'll let Jared handle that because he has real life experience. Yeah, absolutely. In all honesty, I mean, what, when you first start scheduling seed, um, because most of the routes are going to end up being not service, their machines aren't going to be serviced as often, it's really not that difficult at all. I mean, once you get the flow of how everything works, what your colors mean that you're looking at and, and you know, your depletion limits that you're, that you're hitting, I, I still think even a beginner can schedule a route in 10 minutes or less. Um, I, I, we really had no problem getting into it. And uh, that's why my scheduler ended up being a former route driver with a lot of experience because when you're looking at a machine and, and you almost visualize exactly what you're seeing just with a, a planogram instead of the machine in front of you. And and I think that scheduling, uh, because of how easy, you know, Channel USAT's back-end system is in the scheduler, is I, I think that it can still be done by a beginner in 10 minutes or less. Awesome. So next question, can you clarify dynamic scheduling at the micro market? We don't have micro market integration yet on our end. Can you treat each section like you do assets in traditional vending? I'm, I'm glad to see some uh, market questions because, I, and I know that you know there's we're we're still adding to the list of providers that we can uh, uh, provide market service to. But a lot of people ask me, well, you know, how, how does this improve? And you know, Jared, who fortunately is you know coincidentally has um, beta tested um, some that we haven't even released yet, but he also has those that we do. I think he's uh, the ideal person to speak on this. Yeah, so just kind of a, a background on how it, how it works. Um, each, you have the option to treat um, whatever section in that micro market a, as its own asset. So how we handle it is a 48 inch snack rack is an asset. A beverage cooler is an asset. And the, it is scheduled just the same way. You're able to set up depletion limits. You're able to set up you know capacities and par levels. Um, and that way you're, you're basically looking at multiple sections of the, the micro market become multiple vending machines. And that's the way it looks for your driver too. Um, so some of the benefits are you're scheduling each, each asset individually if you want to dynamically schedule them. Um, so you can look at the depletion limits, you can look at the max cash that's in there and things of that nature. Um, and you can also, your driver has very little, he has no training when it comes to the markets because he's used to servicing them as vending machines. You can photo audit your markets. You can inventory on seed mobile, which makes it much, much more efficient. Um, so we've seen great, great benefits from dynamically scheduling markets. And, uh, you know, it allows you, you can still change your inventory intervals if you want to make sure that you keep it real tight so that you're inventorying more often of the markets. Uh, we still like to have most of our markets inventoried uh, uh, once a week at a minimum. Uh, but at the same time, dynamically scheduling them may allow you to only hit that beverage cooler once a week, even though you're going for food two to three or even five times. 
Thanks, Jared. Yeah, thanks, Jared. I think that actually actually kind of feathers into the next question too, potentially, which is if a dynamically scheduled machine is in the same bank as a static scheduled food machine, would the dynamic machine only request service on the day that the food machine is scheduled for? Well, that it's it's a little more complex than that. So a static machine can be the lead machine that pulls in a dynamic machine. It certainly can. Um, so even an interval machine, if it's reached its maximum service interval, can pull in a, a machine. Um, if a dynamically scheduled machine absolutely has to be serviced today, it will not pull in a static schedule because the static schedule is just that, it's a hard schedule. Um, so it's kind of like the reverse probably of what the question really intended, but um, the static schedule can pull in the dynamic uh, the dynamic cannot pull in a static. It can pull in an interval, but not a static. All right. Uh, another one, typically how many different selections do you offer in a glass front beverage machine? I'd like to maximize fills, but I'm nervous to cut variety. <laughs> so first of all, I'll say my, what I would recommend is probably somewhere between 15 and maybe 20. Um, Jared, on the other hand, I think he has a far different opinion. And, and I think that's what's great about vending is that, you know, everybody has uh, different ways they do things. Uh, I know Jared, they, they have quite a bit of variety in their glass fronts. I'll let him explain why. Yeah, and it, the question, it, it's very account or location specific uh, but our, our standard setup that we go out with we like to incorporate a lot of individual flavors of our, our juices and our energy drinks and our Gatorade options so that we have that nice color we have that nice merchandising effect kind of looks very similar to a convenience store but we still make sure that our core flavors have ample capacity in there uh, I'm about 20 to 25 on my standard setup however after merchandising I may end up getting that down to that 12 to 15 mark when I pull out the sellers that, you know, are, aren't moving whatsoever. Um, but when I go into an account I'm, I don't have any sales data on or I'm not very familiar with, I like to go with my best foot forward and then reduce SKUs down the line if I need to, to make sure that the best products are available on what they're buying. Got it, that makes sense. Um, so next question. Is there a way to compare the number of days to sell out on an item to the number of days the product will outdate? Um, well, actually, the way we, we look at it is, you know, when it, you're looking at a whole machine. So you take the, the sh you know, the item with the shortest shelf life and that becomes the days between service. Um, typically, that's going to be pastry on a snack machine. It's usually going to be a, either a diet product or a diet caffeine for, um, product, caffeine-free product, and a, a soda machine, and that becomes it. That's, it. that's why typically you'll see that our standard setup for a snack machine is it's usually going to be 21 days because um, you know most people are using like Clover Hill and Mrs. Freshly's nowadays, and that's about what they have—a little over 21 days. Um, the soda machines, for example. Most people will go 45 or 60 days on those um, unless they want to service a machine at least once every month, and then they'll probably go 30, 28 or 30. Got it. So the next question is for Jared, and the question is, what parameters do you have your market pre-pick plan set at? Okay, so this would be in regards to the actual um, like rounding rules and thresholds, or I, I might need a little more information, or is this in regards to the actual um, how many depletion limits I'm hitting at, at each market? Because um, depletion limits, we actually keep them very similar to our snack machines. Uh, our standard setup for a snack machine is, is three UPCs, and our standard setup for a glass run is, uh, is two UPCs because of the variety that we use. Um, as far as pre kit plan, um, I mean, that's pretty in-depth. I could go through exactly what we have. We've, uh, we've created it, my market manager and myself kind of created how we wanted to handle it. Uh, but the majority of the market, besides the beverage coolers, is send all. Just because you have such low capacity on a lot of those, that we're sending pretty much every product that's sold, except for candy, in which we use a lot of full boxes 
and the, the beverage coolers, uh, we set those up to a rounding rule as well. Yeah, I think that's a big difference that I've noticed with markets, Jared, is that um, beverages typically won't have rounding rules now um, like they would with vending. Uh, it is because of the capacity. They're, they're probably set up more like a glass front. Um, but the funny thing is that candy now, people are rounding those to the box. Um, so that when they get down to a, you know, I don't know, five or 10 Twix bars, they send a whole box. Um, so your, your pre-pick plans certainly are different with markets. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Our, our candy is we have it set at uh, when it hits, you know, 85% of that full case, we're sending another chase out. So, you know, that's a perfect example of one that you, we're utilizing. Got it. Uh, actually, another question on markets. How do you discipline or handle drivers to not put the product in market locations where they where something else is supposed to be? They believe that they know more than we do. How do we handle those situations? pre kit <laughs> but jared do you have any examples or i mean i mean that's that, that's the easiest answer uh, and, and you know look there, there'll be times where there's issues uh you know with drivers not having or you putting the wrong product in there because it was picked wrong in the warehouse little things like that uh, but the, the best feature for us and and something we've learned to, to love is the photo audit on seed mobile and uh, you know what you're supposed to have in there. And, uh, you know, as long as your warehouse is picking the product that's, that's set up properly, the photo audit confirms that it's there. And uh, you're able to kind of make sure that you have evidence that your market looks exactly like it should on the computer screen. And uh, I think that's one of the best features of Seed Mobile with markets. Got it. Next question. How do you handle rescheduling machines with spoilage from previous visits where you pre-kit? Jared, you've got real life experience. You want to talk about that? Sure, and it's it's absolutely a a, a piece of it. Um, you know, the, the snack machines that you're letting go to 21 days because they're low volume. Uh, when you get to these locations, there are going to be uh, quite a few empty column or quite a few columns that may be empty because of spoilage when when the driver leaves. Um, we'll usually circle back to that location in another couple days. Uh, but the key here is to stay on top of your merchandising. And if you're spoiling those products out, please don't go back out with the same product. Make sure that you're, you're paying attention to what your spoil reports are saying, why you're going back to that. And it kind of all feeds back to the whole purpose of allowing your scheduler to merchandise and say, why am I going back to this low volume location in the same week or, you know, it, within a, a few days. So this allows your, your, your scheduler to make those changes on the fly and change the products so that hopefully you're not seeing that spoilage the next time. Yeah, I, I agree with Jared. I think proactively merchandising helps reduce those issues. Um, unfortunately, those issues, you know, spoilage, and that's one of the reasons why you can't really pre-kit a, a carousel food machine. It, you know, pre-kitting and, you know, really low volume machines, you know, they, they struggle, admittedly. Um, I have seen operators that will carry, you know, some extra product on their truck, you know, of those items that are susceptible to spoilage. Um, such as pastry or even um, chips that go out of date pretty quick. Um, they get pretty complex with it, and they have some really good techniques for doing it. Um, too much probably for this conversation, but uh, I'm sure we'll have opportunities to talk about them. Great. Uh, so a question on merchandising. How often do you merchandise your machine? Uh, for us, we, we have a schedule, so um, we try to touch every route um, every 90 days full across the board. Um, like I said, we're merchandising machines on a daily basis just going through the scheduling techniques, and we try to make sure that we're hitting that. Um, but every 90 days, we want to make sure that we hit at least every route. And we have a rotating scheduler schedule that both my market manager, my route supervisors, and my scheduler go through to make sure that we're touching these accounts. And then when we do a new installation, we also look at a uh, 30 days and 90 days out so that in 30 days, we can make some quick par adjustments on products so that we're not sending out too much or too little product. And then 90 days, we start making some merchandising changes right away because we want to make sure those new accounts, you know, see the new product and see that we're making changes that are benefiting the, their location. 90 days is good because it's probably going to coincide with seasons as well. Um, you know, what we see is, you know, especially like I live in Florida and I, I ran a vending operation in Florida. So 
what I always, you know, our seasons aren't as drastic as the rest of the country, but I did see a, a big change between summer and winter. You know, people drink a lot of Mountain Dew in the summertime, more Coke or Pepsi in the winter time. So, um, you know, I would say seasonal um, with addition of what Jared had mentioned. I think it, it's a really good practice to try to get through all your routes. And, you know, he stated 90 days. I think that's an excellent starting point. Great. And a couple of questions on photo audit. I'm going to combine the two together. One, can you explain photo audit and what that is? And second, can you set photo audit schedule like you would for inventorying a vending machine? So photo audit itself is Seed Mobile, when you visit a machine, you can actually take a picture of it. And then that picture will appear on the machine page. Um, so that allows, you know, whether it's a scheduler or somebody else from the office to look at a machine, make sure the planogram's straight for one. Um, it could also be used to make sure that the machine is clean. Um, you know, if it's a coffee machine or something like that, where, you know, probably knowing what products in there are not so easy. Um, as far as scheduling it, no. Um, typically that's going to be, you know, just a statement from somebody like Jared who says, I want a picture taken of every machine or I want a picture taken of this location, uh, things like that. Yeah, we, I, I've spoken to a lot of different operators about ha how they handle photo audits. Uh, we personally utilize the photo audit um, for markets are, are taking, they're taking a picture of at every service. Um, whatever asset they're servicing, they take that picture so that we can compare the planogram and make sure that even if uh, the assets are scheduled or whatever the case may be, they are merchandised and, and fixed and cleaned up. Um, with snack and beverage machines, we have them take a picture at every inventory. Uh, we inventory our machines um, as a default setting every four times. So at every fourth time, they'll take a picture with the inventory, and this allows us to make sure that there's no empty columns that coincide with an inventory that may not be showing in the uh, as an empty column also allows for cleanliness. Uh, we use photo audits for our coffee machines. The drivers actually take pictures of the inside of the machines so we can make sure that they're they're clean and when they leave like they should be. Um, so there's a lot of different benefits to the photo audit. But yeah, we do ours at every inventory. Got it. Well, that's great. I think that's all the, the time we have now for questions. Thank you to everyone that submitted them. You guys asked some, uh, some great questions. And also a huge thank you to our guest presenter, Jared. Really appreciate you coming on today. It was a lot of really good insights. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate being here and, you know, sharing some experiences I've learned with, with Seed. And, you know, Terry was kind of my mentor, so it was nice doing this with him as well. Fantastic. And, Terry, big thank you to you for driving the majority of the presentation. Uh, and, again, thanks to everyone else. So, uh, for anyone that would like to see a recording of the presentation, we'll be sending this out to anyone that is registered. Feel free to share that to anybody else. Then also, like we said in our invitation, we'll be sending out the three ways to schedule like a pro guide uh, to everyone that, that registered as well. So thank you all again for joining and hope to see you guys next time on our next webinar.